All right, now in Acts chapter 22, of course, this is starting off. Let's, let's jump back real quick to the end of Acts 21 to bring us into context of, um, of where we are because basically in Acts 21, you know, Paul was, uh, the Jews found Paul in the temple and they got all upset and they got real mad and they were about to kill him. They were about to tear him to pieces. They were beating him. So when this, um, when the centurion heard about it, when he saw the chief captain came, and you know the, the Roman captain came and, and, he, and he took Paul away from him before they killed him because he wanted to know what was going on. You know, it was this big mob and they're and they're beating some guy. So he goes in there and they rescue Paul, and um, they're leading him away because he's trying to figure out what's going on and he can't really figure out what's going on. So these guys, this, the chief captains, bring him away into this castle. And as they're bringing him away, Paul says, okay, wait a minute, you know, um, can, can, I, can I say something to you? you know, and it says in um, verse 39, it says, But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, so now all of chapter 2 here, or the beginning of chapter 2, at least, 22, he's starting to, to speak unto the Jews that were just beating him and, and trying to have him arrested and everything else. Says in verse 1, Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. See, up to this point, like, I mean, they basically just took him and just started beating him, right? I mean, it's not like he had any opportunity to just actually speak for himself. I mean, they didn't even know, like they just assumed that, that his friend had gone into the temple when he hadn't, um, you know, because he, he was an Ephesian. That was one of the things that got them infuriated, that they think that he's defiling the temple because he brought an Ephesian into the temple and everything else. So at this point, I mean, he hasn't even had a chance to defend himself at all. So he starts talking to him. It says in verse 2, and when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. And he said, so now it's like, and, and that's interesting. So in, at the end of chapter 21, it mentions that he started speaking to him in the Hebrew tongue. And it mentions it again in, in parentheses here in, in verse 2. And it's not there by accident. Right? I mean, you look at the Bible, it's easy to overread some stuff. But when you look at it, you got to remember that you know nothing's here by accident. It says twice here that um, when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue, they kept the more sign. So there's a lot of people listening. He starts to speak, you know, they're probably still grumbling and stuff, but when they hear, oh, he's speaking Hebrew, that's their native language, that's their tongue. He's not speaking to them in Greek, he's not speaking to them in Aramaic or any other, like, more common languages of the day. He's speaking to them directly in their tongue in Hebrew. So they hear that and they, and they listen up. Now, what I want to point out about this is this still happens today. People, it's human nature, I believe, for people, if you go to them in their native tongue, in the tongue that they know, and you try to speak to them in their tongue, they're going to listen to you a lot closer than if you speak to them in another language or another tongue. Um, and obviously, people have to understand more than one language in order to give you heed, or um, you have to know more than one language in order for them to listen. And, you know, my personal experience with this is that I speak some Spanish. I would not call myself fluent by any means. Um, I took four years of high school, and um, you know, but that was a high school education, not not anything, you know, not anything I really worked very hard at. But more recently, in in the church that I was sent out of, you know, there were some some Spanish classes that the pastor taught, and um, the goal was was designed to to help you to be able to give the gospel to people in Spanish. So I. I have, I have some verses memorized in the Spanish Bible, and, and, I, and I've been soul winning, and I, and I can actually give the gospel to somebody in Spanish. Now, not everybody can understand me. I don't have the best accents. I don't have, you know, all of the, the, the best vocabulary to use. But I've noticed this, and I've noticed this with many, many people. Because in, in Arizona, we have a lot of people that only speak Spanish. They come from Mexico, they don't know any English, and they're living here. So when we go out soul winning, you know, it's a shame to have to, to have to just say, oh, you don't speak English? Okay, see you later. You know, instead of being able to bring the gospel to those people. 
So I thought that this was important, that's why I kind of brushed up on my Spanish a little bit and got to the point where, yeah, now I can actually give the gospel to someone in Spanish. And here's what I've noticed is that even though I'm not fluent, even though I'm not a great speaker, even though my vocabulary isn't great, you know, my grammar is not perfect by any means, my verb tenses, sometimes I get messed up, um, um, you know, I have problems, I struggle, I stutter, I take a while to try to think of, of the right words in Spanish and try to form my sentences. Even though it's not very smooth, even though it's not very easy, I've noticed so many Spanish people speaking, speaking people will actually be very patient and they'll listen. And I notice an appreciation. I've had multiple people thank me for, for, for learning their language to talk to them. And there's just something about learning another language and learning someone else's native tongue that if you do that, I believe there are a lot of people, they're going to listen to you more closely. And you're going to be able to reach people even better. Spanish is not my native tongue. Yet there are a lot of people, because I put forth the time and the effort to learn some Spanish, that a lot of people now will listen when I, when I preach in the gospel, even more than, than a lot of English-speaking people, people will. You know, I mean, obviously I know the English language very well, and I can go out and talk to people, and, and, and a lot of people don't want to hear what we have to say at all. But a lot of the Spanish-speaking people... Probably the majority of them, when, they, when, when I actually start to speak, not all of them, but, but more Spanish-speaking people, when I start speaking Spanish to them, if they don't know English, will listen to me than English-speaking people will. And I think it's because they see someone who's not, the, you know, not a native you know, coming at them with their language. And they appreciate that. And I would encourage you, you know, especially if you have languages, not everyone has um, the aptitude to pick up other languages very well, very easily. But some people do. Uh, I pick up languages relatively easily. It's not, it's not that hard of a thing to do. I mean, it's going to take effort, I think, for anybody to learn a language. You have to put forth the work. You're not just going to you know, put your head on the pillow at night on an on a English-Spanish dictionary and then wake up and through osmosis learn a language. You obviously have to spend some time doing it. But for some people, it's not that hard to pick up, and for other people, it is. And if you have the aptitude to do it, I strongly encourage you to, to pick a language, maybe there's a language, like Brother Sebastian um, speaks some Polish, right? You're, you're, is, that, that's, is that your native language? Or uh, it's kind of mixed? Well, I was born here. Because you you spoke I, a lot of Polish, right? Yeah, up. my so, first language is technically Polish. So someone like Sebastian can do a, a great deal for God knowing that other language and being able, you know, if you go out soul winning, and, and you know, someone you find someone else who can speak Polish, oftentimes you can get a lot farther with that person. Even if they know some English, you start, hey, you start giving them the gospel in Polish, and you start talking to them in Polish, people appreciate that a lot more. They feel a lot more comfortable. They feel like like you're one of them. You know, you, you kinda you gotta get that camaraderie when when you can when you can both speak of the language that they're comfortable with, that they know. And, um, and it can go a long way, and I, and I would encourage everybody to pick up, I mean, even more than one language if you can, you know, as much as you can, especially in Arizona, you know, I would recommend Spanish is the number one language that you should learn, just because of the vast number of people, even up here in Prescott Valley, I mean, I wasn't sure how many there were going to be because, you know, we're not quite, we're not Phoenix and we're not as close to the border, but there's still, there's a lot of people, I run into them from time to time up here where they just speak no English at all. And, um, and typically it's Spanish speaking. So I would recommend learning a language if you can, if you have the aptitude, and taking the time to do that. Um, there's a lot of resources out there in order to learn language. And I, I think we see that here. I'm going to get off this point here in a second. But, um, you know, I, it's really interesting how the Bible says here that they kept the more silence when, when he was speaking. But let's continue on here in verse number three. Paul says, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. So, Paul's starting out here, his appeal to these people, um, his defense, just explaining that basically, hey, I was, I was just like you. You know, I'm a Jew. I was born in this city. I was born in Jerusalem, or born in Tarsus, sorry. 
I was born in Tarsus, but he was brought up in this. He was brought up in, in Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel and um, taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God. He's like, look, you guys are all zealous toward God. So was I. You know, I, I was brought up the same way. I was brought up and um, he gives them the, his credentials and um, he tells them he was brought up in the field of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was someone that was well known. If you remember back in Acts chapter number 5, uh, verse number 34 of Acts 5 says, Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. So here we see Gamaliel in Acts chapter 5, back when um, you know, Peter was arrested, and, and they were deciding what they were going to do with them. This was early on in the book of Acts when they just started performing these miracles and going out preaching the gospel and stuff. They were unhappy about it, and they arrested them. And Gamaliel kind of brings a voice of reason. You know, just say, and he, and he gives the examples of like, remember Thutis, you know, he got all these people after him, but basically it came to nothing. And he's saying, look, if this is not of God, it's going to come to nothing on its own. You don't have to worry about it. And that was a counsel that Gamaliel was given. But the reason why I'm even going back to Acts 5 is because it says here that Gamaliel was a doctor of the law and he was had in reputation among all the people. So Paul's bringing this up to them now in Acts 22 as he's getting you know, carried away and they're trying to kill him. He's saying, look, I'm a Jew. I was born in Tarsus, but I was brought up here. Gamaliel taught me. You know, This Pharisee taught me. I was raised up in the law. He's like, I understand where you're coming from. I had a zeal of God just like you do this day. Verse number, um, verse number four, it says, And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were bound, which were there bound, unto Jerusalem for to be punished. He's saying, look, I persecuted this way. You know, basically the way that he believes now, he says, I persecuted the church. I went after him. I was under the, the orders of the, of the high priest. You know, I was, I was sent out to Damascus to bring these, these believers bound unto Jerusalem. Verse 6, it says, And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. So now he's explaining his encounter with Jesus Christ. Verse number 7, it says, I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. Now, we see here the same story. Paul's recounting the events of what had happened to him earlier with his on, on the road to Damascus. You know, Jesus Christ appears to him in the way. There's this, this bright light, extremely bright light surrounds him. And it's so bright it blinds him, right? And he falls to the ground and, and um, he hears this voice just saying, Saul, what, you know, why are you persecuting me? As he was going about to bring the believers bound unto Jerusalem, he's going to arrest people and bring them back to Jerusalem. Jesus saying, why are you persecuting me, Saul? And... Um, Saul asked him, who are, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. So then he's like, well, what, what do you want me to do? And notice this, it doesn't, he doesn't tell him anything else. He, besides telling him he's Jesus and asking him why, is he, why you're persecuting me, he says, go into Damascus, where he was already headed. Go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. So Jesus doesn't give him the gospel. Jesus doesn't tell him anything else other than that this is Jesus. Don't you know why are you persecuting me? Go into Damascus, and there it's going to be told you what you need to do. A lot of people get. And I covered this earlier in um, in Acts in my other sermon about when this story was covered. But um, you know, a lot of people think that Paul was saved at this point. I mean, he was not saved at this point. Paul was still blinded. He had to be led by the hand. 
into Damascus. And it was there that Ananias came and told him. We're going to see that here. It recounts exactly what happened. Verse 11, it says, And when I could not see for the glory of that light, glory is just the brightness, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. In the same hour I looked up upon him, and he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. Now look at verse 16. It says, Then now, why tarriest thou? Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And again, I covered this in my, in my previous sermon. But basically, all throughout the Bible, you see people calling on the name of the Lord to be saved. Um, Romans 10 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul gets saved when he calls upon the name of the Lord. And that doesn't happen until he already gets to Damascus and Ananias preaches unto him and tells him to call on the name of the Lord in order for salvation to wash away his sins. And it's at this point where Paul washes away his sins, he calls on the name of the Lord, he gets baptized and, and gets saved. And the reason, why it's a, the reason why I even bring that up, the reason why I think it's so important is because there's false doctrine out there that people think that Jesus Christ even though he's not like physically walking around on this earth today, they'll think that he can still appear to people and like get them saved and give them the gospel. See, people think that like, well, if nobody gives this person the gospel, then Jesus will appear to them and give them an opportunity to get saved. And they'll go to this and say, see, this is what happened with, with Saul. But that's not what happened because Jesus didn't preach in the gospel. Jesus didn't get him saved on the road to Damascus. Ananias is the, is the one that gave him the gospel, is the one that, that, got, that ultimately was the one that led him to get saved. Because he's the one that, that told him all that he needed to do. The same way that God has committed unto us the ministry of the reconciliation. We're the ones that are God's messengers that are, that are here to tell people all that they should do, all that they need to know, all that they need to do in order to get saved. That's what God has committed unto us to do. So, no, when people like to use this excuse, and all it is is an excuse not to go preach the gospel, not to go soul winning, not to preach God's word. People use this excuse and say, oh, well, if God wants it to happen, it'll happen some way, one way or another. So, if I don't go do it, someone else will. Well, that's not necessarily true. If you don't go do it, maybe nobody else will. See, God has a plan for you and for your life to go and preach the gospel to people and he has, yeah, he has a plan for other people to preach the gospel too. But there's a lot of people in this world that are not saved. And not everybody is just going to be overlapping with the same, you know, with, with people to talk to. Some people are not going to come into contact with very many people. And God might just have, hey, here's one saved person that's going to come in contact with that person. If they blow that opportunity, maybe, maybe that person won't get another chance. Um, you never, you don't know. And see, that's the bottom line. We don't know. We have no idea... Who might be like that? Who isn't? Who's going to listen to us over someone else? I mean, hey, maybe someone else can go and talk to that person. Maybe someone else will go and talk to that person. But maybe they're not going to be very receptive with that person. Maybe they don't like their personality. Maybe they're going to rub them the wrong way. Maybe they're going to say something that's just going to offend them, that, that you know, their heart's going to be kind of hardened. Now, yeah, the, the responsibility is still going to fall on that person, but what if you were to be the one that talked to them? What if you were the one? Maybe they would listen a little bit more. And see, we don't know. We don't know what that is. You can never use that excuse. Well, if God wants it to happen, it's going to happen anyways. God's not just going to send people to hell. You know, he'll at least give them a chance to, to, to get saved and preach them the gospel, even if no man does. That's not true. He's given unto man that commandment to go preach the gospel. If, if, if everyone's going to have an opportunity anyways, then why would we go out preaching? What does it matter? I mean, wouldn't you rather have Jesus Christ appear to someone than yourself? I mean, to me, that would be more effective. I would think, well, I don't want to screw it up. Hey, if I talk to someone, I might mess it up. I, you know, I'm, I don't know exactly everything I'm talking about. But if Jesus talks to him, I know he's going to do a good job. And then pretty soon, who would go soul winning? Why would he go soul winning if, um, if, if you figured, if you knew or thought that that was going to be the case, that Jesus Christ will just appear to him then? But that's not the case. And that's why he's given us that job to do that. Um, continuing on here. 
in verse number 17, it says, And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance, and saw him saying unto me, saw Jesus, is him, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. Now, that's kind of interesting. It says Paul, after he returned from Damascus, so he was going from Jerusalem to Damascus, and, it, and what he was doing, he was going to, to bring believers back to Jerusalem to, to arrest them and bring them back to be tried and to be punished for their belief, for, for you know, their, what he thought was heresy. But right after he gets saved, he gets saved in Damascus, goes back to, back to Jerusalem, and he's in the temple and he's praying, right? So he goes back to the temple, he's the same man, and he's praying as he falls into a trance. And then Jesus appears to him again, and it, like in his trance he has this vision where Jesus speaks to him and tells him that he needs to leave Jerusalem. He says, look, you need to get out of Jerusalem because the Jews, they're not going to believe your testimony. He says, You're not, they're not going to believe you, and you just need to get out of there. Look at verse number 19 is, is Paul's response to this. He says, and I said, Lord... They know that I am imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on me. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. So Paul answers that, you know, he's like basically, hey, they know who I am, Jesus. You know, these Jews, they, they know that all the work that I've done for them, they know that I, that I went and persecuted the believers. He, you know, they know that I was imprisoning them, I was beating them. I, I was even there, he says, when, when your martyr, Stephen, was put to death. He says, I was consenting unto their death. He said, I knew what was going on, and I was fine with it. I even took their clothing of the people who killed him, basically that evidence that would kind of link them to, to, the, to the murder of Stephen. I took their clothing and, and hid it, you know, so, so the thing would just be unknown, so that there would be no more evidence against these people. Um, He's like, I, I did all that. And he basically he's saying, he's pointing out that he was a trusted Pharisee. Because, I mean, at this point, no one even knows that he, that, that he got saved. He goes back to Jerusalem. Now, he got saved in Damascus. He goes back to, he goes back to Jerusalem. They all think it's the same, the same Saul that they knew. And um, I'm sure, though, at this point, he also probably wanted to go out and tell everyone about Jesus Christ. I mean, I know after I got saved, that was something I wanted to do. It was, I mean, it's something that kind of burns inside of you. You just, hey, I'm saved. And you start telling people. It's a big event in your life. You know, it's something, you receive Christ, and it's like, it's a big deal. And I remember after I got saved, and, you know, I wasn't good at it at all. I didn't really know the Bible very much, but I, I told my roommates how I was living it, because I, I prayed in my bedroom, and I lived with three other guys in an apartment, and, you know, I, I, I prayed to God to save me and, you know, put my faith in Christ and Jesus saved me. And then, like, the next day, you know, I just, just telling my roommates about it. And, you know, they ridiculed me and mocked me and, and everything else. But, um, you know, it was a big deal in my life getting saved. And I'm sure, you know, Saul's thinking the exact same thing. He's like, hey, because he's been, and, and it's probably even bigger for him because he's been so against this movement. Now to finally see the truth and finally realize and finally have the, the blinds lifted off his eyes and he could see clearly. And he did have a good knowledge of the Bible. I mean, he was taught up a Pharisee. He knew the words of God. He had studied this stuff. So when he gets saved, and I think that's why he was, he was able to go sowing and be so powerful right away because now he already had this vast knowledge of God's word even though he didn't understand it before, the knowledge was still there. So now he's able to apply that, what he's learned, or apply the, God's word correctly. He knew, you know, all the stories and stuff. He knew what was written in the Bible and was able to see now, oh, yeah, these are all prophesying Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. So I'm sure he wants to go out and tell the other Jews, say, hey, look, no, this is, this is right. This is the truth. But in Acts 22, uh, verse 21... Jesus answers him because he's saying, like, look, they know who I am. And I think he was trying to say that, you know, why wouldn't they receive me? Since I'm one of them, now I can go in and, and tell them, hey, look, this is wrong. But Jesus knows better, obviously, he says, and he said unto me, depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And that was his commandment because he said, they're not going to receive you. I'm going to send you out to the Gentiles. That's, that's your mission. That's what I have for you to do. 
Now, he knew, Jesus had these plans for him. He knew that they weren't going to receive him. He knew they were going to try to kill him. And um, just like every other time that there was a powerful witness, you know, the Jews always tried to kill him. And what a powerful witness was, was Saul. I mean, someone that was brought up and, and lived a Pharisee and had zeal and was, was persecuting the church and all these things. For someone like that, for someone so dead set against the truth and against Jesus Christ, to then believe on Christ and, and be all for it, hey, that speaks volumes. People can see that. That's a night and day difference from, from his belief and from his faith to now be on Christ. The same thing he fought against, now he believes. That speaks to a lot of people. It was similar to, um, to Lazarus. You remember when, when Jesus' friend Lazarus, Jesus raised Lazarus up from the dead, right? And that was an amazing miracle because what happened then is, you know, everybody knew Lazarus was dead. He was dead for like four days. Everybody knew he was dead. Jesus raised him from the dead and now, and now he's walking around alive and people were able to, to see him and like people were coming and visiting and eating with them and everything else just to see. Like, I mean, hey, if you found out that someone you knew died and then is, is back to life again, you'd probably want to make a trip to go see him yourself and to hear that amazing story and just verify that, yeah, this really happened. And that's what was going on back then so much that, I mean, the people knew this was of God. I mean, after all of the other miracles that Jesus Christ had done, now there's a man that he rose from the dead. That was an extremely powerful witness, and it was so powerful. I mean, the Jews were just like, we got to kill this guy. And that's where they're just like, that's it. Like, he's got to go because he's causing way too much damage. Everybody's believing on him is what they were, what they were saying. And they even wanted to kill Lazarus because his living testimony already was doing so much damage. Just the fact that he was brought back to dead, and they couldn't dispute that. They knew he was brought back to life. They knew it and still rejected it and still just wanted to kill Lazarus. See, these are extremely powerful testimonies, and Jesus knew, hey, these guys that wanted to kill Jesus, the guys that wanted to kill Lazarus, are going to be the same guys that are going to want to kill Saul as well. Because they can't stand to have these extremely powerful testimonies of people that, that God has touched whose lives, God has impacted, and, and can have such a powerful testimony. So look at um, verse number 22. And remember, Saul, Paul is saying all of this stuff to the Jews. All the way up to this point, they hear him. They're listening to everything he had to say. They listen to him when he was talking about Jesus Christ appearing to him and asking, why do you persecute me? You know, he, he, they listened to him through all that. They listened to him when he said he got baptized. They listened to him when he said he called on the name of the Lord. They listened to him through all this stuff and did not interrupt or do anything. But in verse 21, we said, when Jesus Christ said, depart for I will send thee far hands unto the Gentiles. Look at verse 22. It says, and they gave him audience unto this word and then lifted up their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth for it is not fit that he should live. And how, how much does that tell you about these people? They were listening to the whole story without, seemingly without any problems. Now, maybe they were building up a little bit. Maybe they were building up a little bit of anger or resentment or something when we saw about Jesus. I don't know. But they, let him, they, they were listening and hearing him out. But it's interesting that as soon as they, they hear, oh, well, Jesus said to go unto the Gentiles, now all of a sudden, let's kill this guy. Away with such a fellow. You know, it's not fit for him to live. And this shows you that um, basically they truly believed in their, you know, in their racial superiority. The, the fact that they were a Jew, you know, they bought into this, um, this, this notion that they were better than everybody else. And that, that there's no way that he should have gone to the Gentiles because after hearing that, that was, that was the point. That was the tipping point for them. To just say, no, you, we're going to put you to death. You can't go to the Gentiles. Um, and that happens in so many stories throughout, throughout the book of Acts. And see, many of them thought that they were going to heaven just by virtue of them being a Jew. Just by the fact that they were born of the seed of Abraham. Which is exactly why John the Baptist preached what he said to the Pharisees and to the Sadducees. The same people here that, are, that are beat, were beaten Paul, the Pharisees. And the Sadducees, both of them, John the Baptist said in Matthew 3.9, he says, And think not to say within yourselves, 
we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. It was a common belief. That was a common thought that they thought, hey, we're children of Abraham. We're special. We're a chosen people. So because we're born of Abraham, we get a free ticket in heaven. And you know what? There's still Jews today that think the same exact thing. And, and it's sad, but, they, but that's true. And they believe that. And there's a lot of people that think that the Jews are superior, better than everyone else. And it's funny because just me saying that I don't think the Jews are special or any more important than anyone else, just making a statement like that will like get you branded as an anti-Semite. They'll say, oh, you hate the Jews. It's like, no, I just don't think that they're, they're, they're more special than anybody else. I don't think that they're, they're better than anyone else. Oh, well, you're anti-Semitic, then why are you saying this stuff against the Jews? And it's because so many people have this thought that, well, if you don't think they're better than everyone else, and if you don't think that, that we just need to support them and everything and finance them and give them guns and give them support their military and just do everything for them, then you're anti-Semitic and you're anti-Jew. No, I mean, I'm, I'm anti-Judaism, that's for sure. The anti-Christ religion that so many of the people are, 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 have bought into that lie as they did in Jesus Christ's day. But I'm not, I'm not anti the race of Jews, the, the people who were born of the, the seed of Abraham. All I'm saying is that being born of Abraham is not going to get you into heaven. And that's exactly what John the Baptist preached. And that's exactly what Paul preached. Let's continue reading here. Look at verse number 23. It says, And as they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that, they should, that he should be examined by scourging, that he might know wherefore they cried so against him. So, um, basically now you got the chief captain again. He probably doesn't speak Hebrew. He probably only speaks Greek. And um, he didn't really get what was going on here, but basically he sees, okay, now they're ready to kill him again. So, he's like, okay, bring this guy into the castle. He said, I'm going to find out what's going on here. So the way he, way he was going to do that was he was going to examine him by scourging. Scourging is whipping him. So basically he's going to beat it out of him. So he just goes and saves Paul from being beat by all these Jews. And what's he going to do? He's going to go and bring him to the castle and beat him himself to, to, to get him to, to speak about what's going on. He's going to torture him to get him to tell the truth. And... Um, Look what it says in verse 25. It says, And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Now, should it really matter that Paul was a Roman in the action that, that this centurion was going to take or in the action that this, that this captain was going to take with him? I don't think so. I don't think that just because he's a Roman, all of a sudden that means that he shouldn't get beat. Hey, you're not a Roman. Well, we're just going to beat you and we're going to torture you and try to get you to say whatever it is I want you to say. But oh, now if you're a Roman citizen, then that's another thing. I don't think it's right for this guy to take anyone and beat them to try to get them to confess to something. But unfortunately, unfortunately, this is the same exact mindset that so many people have today in this country. I just heard that stupid bimbo Sarah Palin said something about, oh, that's the way we baptize the, uh, the jihadists or whatever in this country. We, water, we waterboard them. And um, that stupid neocon woman needs to sit down and shut up and learn her place and not usurp authority over the man and not be running for government, not be running for these offices to rule over men. And... She needs to not be just so gung-ho on torture like so many other Americans are where people think that they have these special rights because they're, oh, I'm an American citizen, so I have these rights. But those brown people in the desert across the world, hey, they don't have the same rights that we have because we're American and they're not. And we have these rights and they don't have these rights. Just because they're ruled by a different government, because they're ruled by a different group of people. No. That thinking is just completely and fundamentally flawed. In the thinking, first of all, that, that's just saying that the government is who grants us our rights, which couldn't be further from the truth. 
God is the one who gives us our rights. God is the one who ordained all powers. He's the one that gives us God-given rights. Now, uh, thankfully, when our government was founded, you know, people tried to, to, to recognize that, and they tried to write that into the law and what we know commonly as the Bill of Rights, that those aren't rights. And you need to understand these are not rights that the government is giving you. You don't have the right to keep and bear arms just because the government says it's okay for you to keep and bear arms. No, that's not why. The reason why you have the right to keep and bear arms is because you have the right to defend yourself from any enemies that are willing to do you harm. And that right is given to you by God Almighty. You have the right to speak words. You have the freedom of speech. You have the, the freedom to be free from all these. I mean, I'm not going to list off the whole Bill of Rights, but there's more than just that anyways. You have all kinds of rights. These rights are given to you by God. And the government, the, basically the, that document, that old piece of paper and written in the Constitution, those people are just trying to say, hey, look, we're establishing that that you, you have these rights. The government's not giving them to you. You have them. So don't think that it's, oh, our American government gives us these rights. No, you have them. Now, you can choose to ignore them and let people trample them and let, and let the power-hungry, narcissistic, tyrannical people, evil, wicked people in this world just walk all over you and, and disregard the rights that you have. Or you can stand up and, and, and use your rights and make sure that they're not trampled on and not, and not um, thrown away. And this is exactly what Paul was doing. He said, hey, look. I mean, he could have just let himself get whipped, but he's like, no, I'm not going to let myself get whipped. He's saying, look, is that right for you to do this? I'm a Roman citizen. Now, he shouldn't have even had to say he's a Roman citizen. It was my whole point. But he was exercising the rights, even in that society, that, that's something that that person actually had respect unto. He was using that to, you know, because it was his right. And, um, you know, that's also, you know, th this idea of human rights being basic rights that all humans enjoy or should have or th that they do have, whether or not they're recognized by a government, these rights that are given to us by God, that's actually the reason why our country used to have a policy of not torturing people, of not taking a person and whipping them and beating them and waterboarding them and doing all these other things to try to get them to speak or try to get them to tell us some information, which over and over again has already been proven not to be an effective method anyways. Not that that would justify, it's not that the ends justify the means, but either way, it's not effective. I mean, if you're getting tortured, you're going to say whatever it is that people want you to say to get the torture to stop. I mean, that's what happened in the gulags back in Russia. That's what happened all over the place. I mean, history will tell you that people will just confess to anything if you mess with their minds, if you torture them, whatever you do to them. They'll tell you whatever you want to hear. It's not an effective method, and it's wicked it's not righteous at all. God never tells us to do that to people. There are certain punishments that are given for crimes, and that's it, and that's for crimes. And it's not trying to tell you, oh, well, I think you might have done something wrong because all these people hate you, so now I'm going to beat you to free to you to tell me something that, that you did wrong because obviously you had to do something wrong for these people to hate you. That was the mindset here. And it's so disgusting to hear people Try to justify the use of torture. And it's that, that same mindset that people have today. They, they think that they have their rights because they're American. And people that live in other countries don't have rights because they're ruled by a different government. And it's, it's funny how the same people, the same people that will favor, you know, some other people in another country getting getting tortured and getting waterboarded and everything else. If they when they read this chapter, they'll have indignation against the soldier, and and um, you know this guy that was about to, to beat beat Saul here or beat Paul here. They'll have indignation against him. Say, oh, that's not right. They can't be beating Paul. He has rights, you know, like. And they just they just don't get it. They don't get it. They don't they don't they don't understand the concept of having rights given to you by God and. Um, and it's a shame because 
there'd be so much less violence. And then, you know, I didn't do, um, I don't have it in my notes, but all throughout the Bible, it's taught that, you know, I mean, the Bible tells us to, to love your enemies, do good to them that hurt you. The Bible taught when, um, even when there's prisoners of war, to give them, to give them food, you know, to give them water and to send them away, you know, don't treat them evil. You know, I mean, yeah, when you have a war, you fight, you sometimes you have to kill people, but that's in the battle. When you take a prisoner, you, you, you know, the Bible never says to torture them. In fact, it's the opposite. You, you treat them like a human being, you give them food, you give them water that they need. Now, maybe they're captive, but you still, you don't torture them, you don't, you don't beat them and, and treat them inhumanely, like, like, not like a human, like they don't have basic rights as a human being. Um... But anyways, let's, um, let's continue reading here. I think we left off at uh, verse 26. It says, When the searching heard, centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yea. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was free born. And um, it says in verse 29, Then straightway they departed from him, which should have examined him. And the chief captain also was afraid, after he knew that he was a Roman, and because he had bound him. Now, they were afraid, they ended up becoming afraid because they bound Paul, and he was a Roman. That's what it says. And it's, you know, it really is too bad that our police don't have that same fear. They don't, they don't fear when people get arrested, when they, when they put handcuffs on people, when, say, they're an American citizen, right? They don't know anything that went on. They're just going to go in. They're going to come into a scene. They're just going to put handcuffs on you. They're going to detain you, and you didn't even commit a crime. When they ought to have, they ought to fear. When they have, they have no proof they've done anything wrong, and they come in, and they bind you, they take your liberty by, by, by incarcerating you, or by by detaining you and, and keeping you. Um, they, the people that have this authority, these centurions, these soldiers, the police, whoever it is that, that, are, that are given the responsibility of keeping the peace, they need to have this fear. And, and they need to have that type of fear in order to prevent the abuse that goes on from the power that they wield. And, uh, but as our God-given rights get trampled on, by an out-of-control gov government, uh, you know, basically a group of criminals running the country, the, the enforcers lose their fear. When, um, when there's no accountability for actions, when people are able to get away with stuff. I mean, look at what happened with the, with the Kelly Thompson case. If you're not familiar with that, there's a guy in, um, in Washington, I believe, in like Seattle, and he was a homeless guy. And he was out, I don't know, I don't know if he was breaking into cars, but that was like the report, he's in a parking lot. And, um, I mean, he was some, some homeless guy, some, you know, they call him schizophrenic, he probably had a devil. Um, but he was just walking around by the cars, and the police were called, and they had this conversation with him, and they knew who he was, they knew he had issues, and they knew he had problems. And they ended up beating this guy to a bloody pulp, and they beat him to death. And it was video recorded, and you know people were standing by and watching, and there was like six cops on him, and they beat him, and he was crying for his daddy. Daddy helped me, daddy saved me, and, and was not resisting at all, was just on the ground, getting his face pummeled in, and just beat to death, literally to death. He died in the hospital. And um, no fear, police didn't care, and you know what? They didn't even get punished for it. I mean, he, this guy was murdered in cold blood. There's all this force that they had. He didn't do anything violent to anybody, but the cops didn't like his attitude. They didn't like the things that he had to say. They didn't like to have to deal with him. And they killed him. And there's no accountability for what happened. And this is a growing trend, and it's a scary trend. It's, it's growing a lot in this country. I mean, just recently, look what happened to the guy in, in New Mexico. Again, another homeless guy. He was 
illegally camping on a mountain. Just up on some mountain. I mean, I don't know the demographics. I don't know exactly where it was in, in relation to a city or whatever. Whatever. He's up there by himself camping. Right? He's got his tent and his stuff. And police come up. They want, they, you know, they're going to arrest him because you can't camp here. You don't have a permit to camp here or whatever. And you hear him on, again, videotaped. You got him on the video saying, you know, okay, you made a deal, right? You know, I'm, I'm going to come down peace about it. I'm not looking for a fight. I'm not looking for anything bad. You know, like, like you're going to keep your end of the bargain, right? Okay. All right, look, I'm, not, I'm coming down now. Like, everything's okay. This is what the guy's saying. And then, and then you hear the guy, one of the, one of the cops saying, do it. And they shoot him with the beanbag. And they, you know, they stun him. And now all these guys charge him. And the guy ends up getting shot and killed. Because they think he, like, grabbed some knives or something. They shot and killed this guy. They didn't have to initiate force. They didn't have to initiate violence. They had a deal. They talked to him. They negotiated with him for a while. They got him come down. No. And what happened to those, to the, to the officers, to, to the, to the oh, officers, to the murderers? Nothing. Nothing happens to them. There's no accountability. Because they're a gang. There's a group of people out there that, for whatever reason, I am, I am still astonished when people... Can, can just have this utmost respect for the police when all these things are happening and growing and getting more and more and more out of control. Maybe one day being a peace officer actually meant something respectable. Maybe you did something where, where you, were, you, know, you were helping people and, and trying to keep people civilized and calm and, 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 and protecting people from getting beat and being oppressed against. I'm sure that happened at some point. And maybe that's the intention that people have when they go into it. But um, I'll tell you what, these things are happening on a daily basis. They're getting reported on almost on a daily basis, incidents like this where people are just getting killed. And if it's being reported on that often, how many times is it happening where it's not being reported on? Where it's not on video? It's out of control. And there is no more fear. And that the that the that the government or their enforcers have of the people, of people that have rights, of people that have rights given to them by God. There's no fear. And when that fear is gone, that's when the tyranny comes in, that's when you go into bondage, and that's when this, this whole country becomes a police state. And that's where we're in right now. I'm sorry, we're not even headed towards it anymore. That's what we're in. And you might say, oh man, that's you're crazy, you're a nut, you're a conspiracy theorist. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a theory. Kelly Thompson's a theory, right? This other guy in New Mexico is a theory. All the people have been brutalized and beaten and killed and, and, and trampled on. And, and I mean, the list goes on and on and on. You can't tell me that I'm a conspiracy nut. I see the articles every single day. Every single day they come into my feed. I see this stuff. I'm not nuts. You're nuts if you think that you have rights, if you think you have freedom in this country. It's just a matter of time before it comes on you. And then you're going to be looking around and saying, oh, oh, I can't believe this happened to me. Well, yeah, because you didn't wake up and, and see what's happening to everybody. You didn't stand up for anybody else. More people need to realize that they do have rights and that they're not given to them by the government. We need to get off this mentality of the government giving us everything and, and the government needs to do everything for me and, and thank you government for giving me my freedom. No. The government's the one that's taking away your freedom. Laws, yeah. There's a, you know, <laughs> laws restrict you from doing things. That's what they're there for. They're there to restrict you. And this country has grown. I mean, there are new laws being added books constantly over and over. There's so many laws in this country, nobody can know them all. It's like impossible to know what all the laws are in this country. You're losing freedom. It's time to stop powering to the bullies and letting them have their way. It's time to stop consenting and start resisting. The Bible says um, in verse 30, we'll finish up this chapter, it says, and On the morrow, because he would have known the certainty, wherefore he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priests and all their counsel to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. See, this is how the situation should have been handled from the beginning. Which is my whole point. Why, could, why did he have to be a Roman citizen in order to be treated this way? Why did he have to have some extra respect 
because, oh, I'm a Roman citizen, as opposed to anybody else. People ought to be treated the same way. It shouldn't have mattered. And that's why I like Paul's response. When, you know, the chief captain's like, well, the great sum obtained out of this freedom. Like, you know, I had to pay a bunch of money just to be recognized as a citizen. Just to get this freedom as a Roman citizen. I had to pay all kinds of money to get this. But Paul said, I was free born. And as a human being created by God, you're free born too. I don't care what gang of, of, of criminals say that they're ruling over you and say that, that they're the ones dictating what you can and can't do. You were born free. As a human being created by God, you were born free. Now other people come in and try to oppress you and steal your freedoms. But that's why you need to stand up and not let them take your freedoms. And put ultimately, ultimately though, put your faith in God. Live a godly and righteous life. Don't bow down to these people that, that, are, that are oppressors and that are tyrannical. You know, there's a certain place for authority and there's a certain place for, you know, that the Bible says, I'm not going to get into that now, I'm out of time. But um, it's for the punishment of evildoers. That's why government should even be established to begin with. Um, and it's not to, to steal from the people. It's not to, to um, oppress them. But as our country gets more and more wicked, and turns away from God and turns away from His commandments, that's exactly what's going to happen to us to so get prepared for more um, of uh, going into bondage. But uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank You so much for the Bible. Uh, I pray that You would please help us to have the, the courage, the strength, and the wisdom, dear Lord, to know when, to, when we need to resist. And, and what we need to do to, to protect the rights that you've given us. Um, and ultimately, Lord, I pray that you please just help us to clean up our own lives, our own sinful lives, and help us to reach others and, and help them to, to clean up their lives, dear Lord, to help us to reach out and to, and to do the work that you'd have us to do. And um, ultimately, Lord, our faith is in you to protect us and to watch over us. We know that, that this country as a whole has gotten extremely filthy, wicked, abominable, and that as a result, as, as history has proven, as your word has proved, um, you know, the result will be bondage. But I pray that you would please just look out for your people, look out for those of us who are trying to live according to your word and are trying to, to really make an impact in people's lives. God, I pray that you would please just... just um, Continue to use us in whatever state we're in, whether we're bond, whether we're free, whatever it is, Lord, help us to use that to bring honor and glory unto your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, let's turn on one last song, song number 109, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. Song number 109. Let's sing out that first verse. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us. For our use thy fold prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us, Thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us, Thine we are. All right, we're dismissed. Thanks for being here tonight. Oh, stick around. We're going to have some birthday cake for Leslie. And we're dismissed. Happy birthday for to you. Oh, that sounds fun. Happy birthday, Mom. Thanks. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Mom. Thanks. What about you? Say it. Say it. Say, Mama, 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 Mama.